Come higher. So let us begin in prayer as we gather tonight as the RCIA and also simply as a chance to grow and learn about our, our faith. We begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, we've gathered in your house this evening to, to grow in our faith, to share of the faith. I ask you to bless me as I try to teach and bless those who have come to listen, to learn, to question, to ask questions and just be with us and may we always have our hearts open to the grace and the way which you wish to move in our lives. And let this night be a, a time of grace as well. Especially we pray for those who are discerning whether they wish to enter the church, the full communion of the church, that, that the Holy Spirit would work in their lives as well and, and guide them the way you desire. And I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So for those of you who were not here last week, um, how many of you were not here last week? Give yourself away. Okay. Um, no big deal. Remember, this is not an ongoing thing. You can drop in and out of this. This is, comp except for these people. These people, you got to remember, you're auditing, they're taking for credit. So, tennis counts for the, the front people uh, in a sort of vague, friendly way. But um, you guys just come and go. Um, not that I don't care. But I told you, you just, when you make it, you can make it. To, the first, the first time, uh, first night, we were talking about the way in which we, we have an openness to God, uh, that there's a way in which we can receive God, that there's a desire in our hearts for God, and it's all based in that relationship of Jesus Christ and me and each one of us, that, uh, that the, the notion of the Holy Trinity as love is there's a great romantic story, and I'll keep on pressing this, the, this idea of whether we're going to be united with God forever. That's the, that's the drama of every human life. That's what Christ is all about, is saying, I want to unite your, you with me, uh, and this, there can be this wonderful union that's going to be eternal. And, and you can share my life, and you can be filled with this life that I have, and I, that I want to give to you. So that's the whole point of everything we're going to talk about this whole year, is just coming to that reality. And how do I come to that reality? How do I live this God life? How do I get, live the way of Jesus? What does that mean? How do I do it? So that was the first night. And the second night, we talked about revelation. And so if, if we were talking about the natural, the natural way in which sometimes we can know God without revelation, and again, through the, perhaps the, the, na the, uh, the natural world, perhaps through the human person and conscience and the, the notion of good that's in us, all these sort of things, there's ways in which we can have some kind of sense that, God, that there is a God. And yet, remember, I, taking that, that revelation and the, uh, the romantic theme, if you're having a relationship with someone and you, you're interested in them and you think, I, I wonder if I'm in love with them, I, could I be falling, could I love this person? That, that requires a self-revelation. That we, if, we, if we're going to go on a dinner date with somebody, if we're going to you know, wonder, who, I at some point have to go beyond simply my natural senses of I can see how tall they are, I can see what they're wearing, I see how they act, to going and talking to them, where that person can reveal himself or herself to me, and, and, and I can do that to her. There's, and they can start to learn things about me that they never would just by observing. And so that's the whole notion of divine revelation. The idea, now, God already knows everything there is to know about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So it's a one-way revelation in that sense. He doesn't have to say, oh, gee, I wonder who Kurt Nagel is. Um, you know, he knows all about me. Uh, when I bl put my blinders on and I, and I try to fool myself and I lie to myself and I'm sometimes just darkly ignorant about myself, Christ is already in that. He already knows everything about me. And he knows it in a loving way and not in an accusing way because he made me. So it's not like he's saying, uh -huh, I kind of got gotcha. you. Um, you're going to step in that trap pretty soon because I know who you are and you don't. But you're going to find out and then, gotcha. That's not the way it is. Um, he, knows, he knows all of it. But we don't know him. And so Jesus Christ is revelation. So I, now sort of going, this is all quick review, but it's so important to get the Catholic thing that I think it's worth a slight review. Uh, then we're going to go tonight and talk about Scripture. Uh, and it's just, not that we're not going to go through all the books of the Bible or something. We're simply going to say, in theory, this is the way Catholics perceive the Bible as what it is and where it comes from. 
in how it's used and how it's read. Not in detail, but in kind of the big picture thing. And so when we talk about revelation and God's revealing himself to us, revelation, the fullness of revelation is Jesus. Jesus and knowledge is Jesus Christ. Sometimes we think it's a book. Sometimes we think it's something else. No, we say it's a person. Revelation is a person. For, for a Christian, that's just, I, I know who God is, and, and God has shown me who he is by, through this person, Jesus Christ, the fullness of revelation. It doesn't mean that it wasn't some sort of divine revelation before that. We have all the, the Old Testament. We have all the notion of the prophets. We have all that sort of stuff as well. But the culmination and the totality of it is God becoming a human being. Who, can, who we can see and we can talk to and, and who, again, he, he's fully human as well as being fully divine. So, Revelation is a person, but, so how is this person revealed to us? And here we're talking about these three, the three legs of the stool for a, a Catholic understanding of Revelation. We have, first, in the, in the get here, I want to, before I do any more of that, uh, I want to just base it, this whole night on three scripture uh, verses, or, or three little sections. Um, I'm going to read all three of them just to start off with. And I'm going to start with, uh, probably most of you have heard some of these uh, multiple times, but they're the cl classic, classic uh, uh, verses. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that, that, that just tells us how important Scripture is. Now, when Paul's writing to Timothy right there, he's talking about what we would call the Old Testament. But it also includes um, his own letter, eventually, and, and the, the New Testament as well. That whole idea of the, the very foundation of, of Scripture being useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so we can't get around the, the fact that you know, this Scripture is, is essentially important. And yet, how, how, the, where does this come from, and, and, how, and what, where do we think of scriptures, and how, how, what's the context for this? second one I, I want to talk about is, is simply, um, I want to read to you, is 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Um, and remember, actually 13 to 15. I read this last week. So Paul's saying, But we ought to give thanks to God for you always, brothers, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. So he's all, God's already chosen these, these new Christians of Thessalonica uh, for sanctification by the Holy Spirit and belief in what, he's, what Paul is preaching. So this whole idea of the truth. To this end, therefore, he has also called you through our gospel to possess the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this gospel he's talking about is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They have not been written yet. So when he's talking about this gospel, he's talking about the preaching that he's doing, the message of Jesus. And at the beginning, this is an oral message, because the first thing Paul does is not write a book, it, although he writes letters. He goes down to the synagogue or the street corner, and he starts to preach it. And so he finishes with verse 15. Therefore, brothers, hold, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. So this whole idea is, you know, the, the tradition you're going to be given, and it's going to be both an oral preaching and also a written text. There's going to be a mixture there. Because that's the way Paul worked. He both preached it, and he also wrote these letters, there is, in which we eventually gather together as scripture. Um, and so there's this combination of tradition being both an oral form and a written form that is backed up by the apostles. We're going to get to that in just a second. I'm going to finish with uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. If I should be delayed... So this is Paul talking to Timothy. If I should be delayed, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. So he says, it's almost a throwaway line, but he's talking about Timothy. He says, how are you going to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God? The church, he's talking here about this community. How are you going to live in this community of believers that we both have teamed up to, to form under the Holy Spirit's guidance? 
So Timothy is Paul's great disciple. You know, he's his, his younger, he's Robin to his Batman. Um, he is some guy who's really uh, close to Paul, and he's saying that how do you behave in the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth? This idea of this assembly, this, this belief, this, this group of people, this church, ecclesia, is in fact the pillar of truth. And all of those three of those statements kind of point towards this very idea of how, is, how do we know Jesus? And I could ask you, if I had time, if I, then I might ask these people later, so. Um, how did you get to know Jesus? You know, were you watching the robe on TV? Did, was it a Sunday school class? Did your mom teach you Bible stories? Did you have a little, what, how did you know, how did you first come to know about this? Because it was probably a combination of written stuff, oral teaching, and also, you know, these days, videos and everything else. It's, it's multimedia, you know, sort of spread out dump. That's been happening for 2,000 years. And so Revelation is this whole idea of an oral tradition, a written tradition, that means a text, various texts of some kind, and a teaching office of the leaders of the church, the episcopoi or the bishops, known as the magisterium, uh, if you want to get technical in theology in the Catholic Church. And so all of these are working, again, that whole idea of church and the church, the pillar of the truth, the, the written and the oral, uh, the written tradition, the oral tradition of, of Paul, but also backing up the fact that how important these scriptures are, remember that first reading of, these are just central for refutation, for learning and the ways of righteousness, etc. So then I went very briefly through the stages of how the Bible came about. And then uh, once I uh, review this, I'm going to go forward and what we haven't covered yet. There's these four stages of the formation of the New Testament. So I'm not, when I say the Bible, today I'm talking about the New Testament. The Old Testament is still a fluid situation at the time of Jesus. There is no such thing, of course, as the Old Testament. Um, there's the Jewish Holy Scriptures. Uh, for the Jewish people in the time of, of Jesus, you know, there were numerous texts that were considered by some holy texts inspired and some not. The Sadducees, for instance, if you remember them from the Gospels, they only believed in those first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. The Pharisees were much more broad in, in terms of what they thought was inspired and what should be studied and read as the Word of God. And, and there was difference and disagreement between those Jews who spoke Aramaic and knew some Hebrew and those in the diaspora or the sort of the immigrant places of the Mediterranean who had forgotten and never knew Hebrew or Aramaic, Aramaic but spoke simply Greek, the Gentile language. And they had a, a, a Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint that we, uh, we, we know of that Greek Old Testament, and that was their scripture for some Jews. If you were a Jew in Rome or Alexandria, Egypt, or someplace like that, it's very likely that in the synagogue you would have heard Greek. So it's all over the map, the Old Testament. But what we come to think of as the New Testament, we have the life and the teaching of Christ. That's the first thing. When God became one of us, you know, back there in 4 BC, we don't know exactly what year it was, that he taught and he acted. And things happened that were teaching in and of themselves a new way of existence. It wasn't simply a moral teaching, although there was moral aspects to it. It was much more than that. So I, I want to make sure we understand this. What, what the gospel is, is an invitation into the life of God. And we live that life of God. And it, it's, a, it's a training, is a uh, apprenticeship in a new way of life. And Jesus is the master. He's the master training the apprentice in this. He is actually the life itself. He calls himself the life, the way and the truth. So that's the beginning of it all. Then he dies and he rises from the dead. You know the Bible story. The main, the main section of the very main point of the whole Christian beliefs. But after that, the first written text that now is part of the, of the Bible, it was the New Testament, probably wasn't written until around 50, 50 AD. So you're talking about 20 years where there's nothing but oral preaching and teaching of those uh, disciples of Christ. And so that's what Paul's doing. Uh, the, the letter he sends off at the time, he's, 
you know, those aren't being seen yet as being inspired scripture. The Holy Spirit will, will slowly show the church that this is the case, but for him, it's all oral preaching and teaching. And the writing is simply something to back up and remind people of the oral preaching and teaching. But if you really want to get something down, if you have some important thing to say, writing is the way to do it. Um, that way, it can, you can have one text, it can be teaching as many people as can hear it when it's read out loud. For the, the, even the written text at this time, almost all were, written, were, were heard out loud. You know, books were very expensive, they were very rare, literacy was, was very rare, and so you heard the written text preached and proclaimed. But eventually, between roughly 50 AD and 100 AD, you have these written texts that are formed and, and, and are part of the Christian environment of the teaching and the preaching. And eventually, but again, the idea that these are inspired by the Holy Spirit is something that is the dawns on the church. That it's a slow formation. There's no revealed table of contents of the New Testament. We have one in our Bibles now, but that's a product of the pillar of truth, which is the church. Because as I remember, remember the, the, the very idea of all of these texts were floating around and being read by Christians, written by these various disciples and disciples of disciples of Jesus. And some of them, how do we know to put it, how do we want to say these are defined as inspired or not? How did, how did that come about? Again, there's no revelation of here's the contents, you know, these are the books that I, the Holy Spirit, have written. There's nothing like that. It's a messy 300-year process between 100 and 400 A.D. by which the church and the bishops of the church decide about which text should be read at liturgy and which should not. The Eucharist is the determinant. Is this something that should be read at Eucharist on Sunday or not? Is it something that actually underlines and teaches these two things? Is this, the, is this the, the life of Jesus as it's lived out in the lived community and experience of the church, which is the community? Does this text strengthen further but is in conformity with that gospel message, that way of life? Some of them got kicked out because some of the churches thought yes, some thought no. And eventually said, no, 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 no. Remember the Gospel of Thomas and the letter of Clement read in some Eucharistic celebrations for part of the time, eventually you get dumped. So by 400, you have what we call the New Testament. It's the, it, it's the formation of the canon, and then we have the Bible, as we, was, as we would know it today. Now, going forward, so now I, I spent the first part of this class just trying to reteach that, but it's very crucial because if you don't understand how the Catholic Church understands the, the church's role in the formation, the interpretation of Scripture, you're not going to get the Catholic thing. I'll just finish then with, the, remember the, the Supreme Court thing? That every text needs an, an interpreter. No text interprets itself. Text just simply lies there. You have to read it and then, uh, so what does it mean? What does it mean? Remember the Ethiopian eunuch in the Acts of the Apostles is going down the Gaza Road and Philip comes and is sent by the Holy Spirit to interpret this, he, he's, this, this poor guy is saying, I'm reading the scriptures but I don't understand what they mean. Could you tell me? We always need an interpreter. And so for the Catholic Church, we, what our belief is, is that the same people who form the canon are the ones that God wants to interpret the canon. And the successors of those first bishops who formed the New Testament are still the ones who are ultimately responsible for saying, this is what it means, and even more important, this is what it doesn't mean. Because oftentimes there's multiple meanings in a text. You can't just say, this, this, this scripture only means that. You say, no, I could study that scripture for decades, decades, and still just keep on getting more of it. But I can't say, well, this particular interpretation is out. That's not, that's not what this means. And it's like the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is, remember, how do we keep the United States together, living a, a way of life as a community? Well, we do it by law. And the U.S. Constitution is the, the primary text for our lived out experience. And it's a text that tells us how to live, and yet we disagree about it sometimes. And ultimately, so if this is really going to work, we need a, a way of interpreting the text. What does it really mean? 
So the Supreme Court is the, is the one who, uh, is the institution, the group of people, who have been given the responsibility and the authority to interpret the text. And to be an American is to accept that. When, it, when we don't accept that, we have civil war. Remember, we, in, in the time of the Civil War, we did not agree upon the notion of slavery and all these other things. We say, there was some, we, just had a, we just couldn't agree on it. And it broke the, it, the, the Supreme Court had decided, and my people said, no, I don't believe it. They took it to a higher court. The difference is we say, well, although, I, again, I love the, the United States and the Supreme Court is part of the Constitution, and I respect it, I don't think it's divinely inspired or led. I, don't think the Holy, I do not think the Holy Spirit in, in this particular way always leads the, the Supreme Court to make the right decisions about the most pressing issues. But we do, as, as Catholics, believe that the apostles are inspired by the Holy Spirit for this role. In formal, crunch time decisions about what does Revelation mean, who is Jesus, and what is his way of life, we say the Holy Spirit will not abandon the, the apostles and their successors. It's an act of faith. That's a matter of faith. Can't prove it. Um, so, there we are in, in terms of, I'm now ready to go forward to the scriptures and, and just talk about the Bible a little bit. About, okay, what are these written texts and, and, and how, do we go about, how do we go about thinking about them? I want to just talk about the, the very idea that we're, our understanding of the scriptures is different than, for instance, perhaps the uh, Islamic understanding of the Quran, where they have this very, very clearly belief that God was deliberately and very explicitly uh, dictating to Muhammad of what the Quran should be. And there's only one author, God, and the only, there's only one prophet who's Muhammad. That's their text. And they say, oh, you know, it happened to this one person this one way, and it was one time, of course, of course of time, but this one period, and that's it. We say, no, God, God speaks to the human person in human ways. Because again, there's a whole incarnational aspect of Christianity. That somehow, God does not despise us, he doesn't hold us in contempt, he wants to talk to us in a way that we understand, in a human mode. He talks to human beings in a human mode. And so the authors of the, of the scriptures, we do say these are inspired texts because the Holy Spirit is guiding these authors. The Holy Spirit, but not in a direct, I can hear your voice, Holy Spirit, stop, wait a minute, Lord, you're, holding, you're going way too fast, I'm, you're getting ahead of me. It's not that kind of direct dictation. We don't, uh, you know, other than perhaps the book of Revelation, the New Testament, you, you don't have that kind of that evidence. What you do have is human beings acting in faith and writing in faith, and in the Holy Spirit guiding them, not probably explicitly, for the most part at least, but nevertheless guiding very much what they write and what they are and what they're doing. But the, the, the result of all this is that these scriptures are, and I'm juggling my, my text here because I'm actually working through, from two sets of notes and trying to get these things to come together is going to be probably chaotic. But, I want to talk about, we're going to, private inspiration of the scriptures, just uh, we're going to hold off on that. The public revelation, how, for instance, how do we know what God wants us to believe and know about him and about our lives? Those are the things, those are the things we mostly want to know. This is kind of like this, this public teaching, the doctrine of the church. The doctrine of Christ, the Christian followers. How do I know what, what the church's teaching is on salvation? How, what, or or what, does it mean? what is that baptism that's appearing in the New Testament? What does that mean? What's the point of all that? What is marriage? What is marriage? Huge topic today. Um, you know, all those questions. Um, what's human life? What's the purpose of human life? What happens to us when we die? Those are all kind of doctrinal questions that will be true for everybody. So that's kind of the public nature of the scriptures, the written text. How do we know that? That's a little different than this private inspiration. I want to talk about, about this, this public aspect of this teaching, the teaching power of the Bible. Now, we have two senses of scripture in the, in the Catholic Church. There's the literal and what we call the spiritual. There are some Christians who are very much literalist and only literalist, although they never really are because you can't be, because they are 
there's contradictions sometimes in the Bible about various big things or small things. But there's no doubt the meaning conveyed by the words of sacred scripture sometimes are just literally true. It just means what it says. Um, there definitely is a literal meaning of the text of the scripture. But there's also spiritual sp aspects of the scriptures. There's allegory, there's analogy, there are morals in the scripture that again, are, that they're not necessarily meant to be historically literally taken, and they weren't by the people who wrote them. So if we, if we really believe that there are these two senses of scripture, both literal and, and spiritual and understandings, and sometimes these are laid on top of each other. There are multiple literal means of scripture text perhaps, or at least uh, possibly, but there are also maybe multiple spiritual meanings for other text as well. And so it's not like you can ever take a, a text of scripture and think, okay, I've got it. Um, I've, got, I've, I've rung it dry. Um, I've mastered that one. Take it on the next one. I'd never have to go back to that one because I've learned everything there is to know about that one. Please don't read me this, the Good Samaritan anymore because I've got it all. That's not the way it works. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about private inspiration of scripture. But the reason you can talk about spiritual elements of scripture is that there are different genres of scripture. So I'm just going to... Now, what is... This is an open question. What is a genre? That's a weird French word. Anybody know what a genre is of, script, of, of literature? Give me an example of a genre. Show yourself how smart... Oh, an adventure novel. Okay. Something else. Well, okay, I'm talking about literature rather than music. So, yeah, in music you'd have it maybe jazz versus a concerto or something. A type of thing. A type of thing. So give me a type of literature. And give me a, give me a genre of literature, a type of literature. Poetry. Mystery. Play. Drama. Um, haiku, um, all these different kinds of ways in which um, history, uh, history. So you have all these genres, and you have, so you have things called gospels. That's a genre, by the way. It's a particular, it has a particular shape, form, meaning, and intention. You have history in the Bible. You have poetry in the Bible. You have uh, proverbs. Did any of you grow up with uh, Kung Fu, the, the, the TV show Kung Fu, Kwai Ching King, remember him? And the old masters who would give those little, those cryptic little sayings. Those are Proverbs. Um, I always thought those were pretty cool. Until I, then I read the book of Proverbs and they didn't, they didn't seem all that, I mean, it was a whole different thing. Um, but there's letters, there are letters in the Bible. There are psalms, so songs, somebody said songs before. Uh, and there are lyrics to songs in the Bible. There are all sorts of things in the Bible. There, there are apocalyptic, there are laws. So the key to understanding the scriptures is to be able to understand who wrote it in human terms. The Holy Spirit always writes it in, in, in divine terms. But who wrote it, when, why? And what kind of... What kind of uh, genre were they writing in, because that determines about, okay, how are they going to use language? It may not be, uh, you know, you have, how you express yourself in a song may, may be different than in a history of what you use, how you use the language. And sometimes you use analogies and metaphors and these sorts of things in a song that you wouldn't in a, in a law text. Law has to be kind of really exact. Of course, yep. Yeah. So you have to find out what, what's the cultural basis for this. Where, what culture are they talking about? When they talk about a wife, what does that mean in that particular culture? If they talk about the king in that particular culture, what's the, the, what does the king mean? So if you're talking about God as king in this culture, it might be different than the God's king in that culture. So you have to know where it's coming from because God speaks to human beings in human modes, although divinely inspired. Now, to say that, though, is not to say, and so we all made it up. It's, it's not at all that way. Oftentimes, again, I'm not taking away the literal meanings. I'm not. Oftentimes, uh, the literal meaning is the best way to go. Because I want to show you, I want, uh, I, or I want to tell you, probably, 
there's a danger. The danger in bitter, biblical literalism is that it doesn't recognize literary forms. It, it, it doesn't agree with this and they don't believe it really happens this way because it's all directly from God and that's, that's all it is. And there's not the human mode. It's also the divine mode. There's not the, if you want to put it this way, there's not a hypostatic, hypostatic union in the text. There's not a human and divine. It's all just purely divine. So it all has to be literally true because God wouldn't lie. So if you don't understand or believe their genres, then there's, there can be that literalism. Um, uh, they, they, again, the Catholic Church would say leads to misinterpretation. But on the other hand, there also is a, a fancy word or phrase, historical reductionism, that is also dangerous on the other side. And the problem with the, the uh, assumptions of the historical re, uh, reductionist, um, somebody who really doesn't take the Bible literally at all, doesn't believe in the literal meaning of the Bible, is that there's a denial of the supernatural order usually. That they don't really, those, they don't really believe there's a possibility of miracles because they don't believe there's that, the supernatural order. Um, they're, not in, they're not open to the very interpretation uh, because they, it can happen, therefore it can't mean that. And so if there's no uh, belief in the supernatural order, there's no belief in God's intention uh, to intervene in the world through his own revelation. If you don't believe that there's, there's a possibility of miracles, if you believe faith and truth are, seem to be incompatible, um, if you assume against the historicity of the text, then you're also going to misinterpret the text. From a, a Catholic perspective, you'd say, you're going to get it wrong because you're not even going to let into your whole universe of interpretation some basic elements of what the faith says. That, in fact, God does intervene. There is a supernatural sphere. There are miracles that can take place. And that this stuff really happens. There's a historical element to it. So there's a fine balance there that has to take place. And so, again, I erased it. But this is for the, this public, the public uh, revelatory dimension of the scriptures. You have to hold all of that within your embrace to understand scripture. Now, the Catholic Church also would say in, in terms of, of scripture, so how do I read the Bible? Where's the show, where is it in the Bible? Well, how is this going to work? How do, you, how do I interpret the scriptures? I'm not saying don't write the Bible. That's, a, that's the old attack on Catholics. Is they say, the priest will tell you don't read the Bible because you'll get it wrong. Um, now, maybe decades ago, you may, some of your older people or seniors, um, experienced uh, Catholics may, may have heard that. Um, I'm certainly not, I'm telling you to read the Bible. Will you get it wrong? Yeah, you get it wrong all the time. Um, that's, that's okay in the sense of, you know, at some level, it's okay. Because you say, oh, you know, you're going to make mistakes in, in just reading. So what does this mean? I don't quite know. Maybe it means that. And you find out later, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, okay. But for this big public revelation thing, who are we? Where are we going? What's baptism mean? What's salvation mean? What's this all, that all? What's it, what, what does it mean? Three criteria for interpreting Scripture with the Holy Spirit. Remember, this, ultimately the Holy Spirit's the author. The first is to read in the context of the whole Bible. Uh, there's a unity of Scripture. Now, that seems to the historical reductionist to be a nonsense. For a historical reductionist, this is simply dozens of texts from the ancient world. And their relationship to one another is simply a false construct. There's some people with the thing called faith put these together thinking that there's some God, God has put all these intentions. You know, but they're just different texts that have been put into one cover. Now, it is true that this, the Bible was written in human terms between roughly the first ideas of it Roughly, 1000 BC to 100 AD. That's just general. And there are all these different genres that are taking place. There's dozens of books. It's a library, not a book. But it, it, its unifying element, why this is just a book, is that the Holy Spirit is behind it all and guiding it all, informing it all um, in all of those ways that I already put up. So God is behind this all. So there's a coherency and a structure here. To this book. And therefore it can teach us, it can guide us, and it can form us uh, through the Holy Spirit into that way of life that leads to union with God. 
So it's not just this random collection of, of texts that have been put together by these strange people who would believe these myths. But if the Holy Spirit is the author, ultimately, then you have to read it with the Holy Spirit. So it is a whole. Read the whole thing. So you interpret one text in, in relationship to everything. You don't just take one text and say, in, in 2013, this text here in Ecclesiastes 5.12, this is what it means. And because I can just take that one little text out and say, so this is what God wants you to do. Where it says, kill all the Canaanites. Yeah, see? God wants you to wipe them out. Genocide's okay. Um, that's not what's going on here. You have to read that text in, in relationship to everything, the whole Bible. Also, you, live, you read the text in relationship not to the, just the, the whole Bible, but the whole history of the church. So I, I, I erase this. But it's not just a matter of, let me give you a hot topic, um, homosexual acts. doesn't get hotter than that, right? So how do you interpret those seven or eight New Testament texts, or whatever they are? I forget the number. How do I interpret what the Bible means there? Well, I could just take one little text out of Leviticus or something, or Romans 1, and I could just use that. I say, well, wait a minute. No, let's look at the whole scriptures. What does it say? Because you always have to uh, interpret this in terms of the whole Bible. Put it all together. But it's not just put it all together in, in terms of the text. It's also in what is the tradition of the lived community of Christ said over the last 2,000 years? So how, how, is the, how has the church lived out this reality for 2,000 years? Because this has been a, re a reality the whole time. So what's the history of this interpretation within the church? Within the church. Because again, remember that whole idea of those, those successors of the apostles being this, this group that is inspired by the, the Holy Spirit in interpretation of the text. So, you, you, you don't only write, read the, the Bible in terms of the whole Bible, but also the whole living tradition of the church. And then, the, the coherence of the truths of the faith among themselves, what's called the analogy of faith. That the truths are not going to be contradictory. Um, there's a coherency. Again, the Holy Spirit has written this. The Holy Spirit is not sort of this schizophrenic thing. There's a, there's a totality and a coherence to what's, what's being taught and what's being communicated through the Scriptures. Now, I'm going to stop there and just briefly. Any questions at this point? Probably a million, or maybe not. You read it in the context. You read it in the context of the whole Bible. You read it in the context of all of the history of the church. So the context of the lived tradition of the community. But then also there's an analogy of faith, which means this truth has to also there has to be a coherence between the different truths that are being taught by the scriptures. They're not going to contradict each other. I mean, actually, I'm just going to blast through, okay? Because I, there wasn't instantaneous hands. For those of you who are in the uh, RCI, we'll have a chance to talk about this later. But I want to talk a little bit about the very problem of, of, again, that whole notion of using the Bible as this public revelation of Jesus, public rev of Jesus, and using it as a means of private inspiration and prayer. Now, the Catholic Church, I think historically, I mean today, just today, Catholics are pretty comfortable in lots of ways with the, the Bible as this public means of revelation, of doctrine. Sometimes people, the Catholics aren't because they don't go straight to say, what does the Bible say? By the way, that's a, that's a typical question when, uh, when I talk about uh, Catholic teachers or something, they say, show, show that to me in the Bible. Again, I say, well, let's go back to what I just said. You know, you're not going to take the one little, one little there's, there's the lived tradition of the church that teaches, there's the oral tradition still, there's the written tradition, there's the teaching of the, of the apostles. Let's look at that whole totality here. Um, you, you, you can only understand the teaching of the church and teaching of Jesus Christ in, in terms of all of that. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valuable question. Where, what does the scriptures have to say about that? That's a perfectly legitimate question. 
But to say, if it's not explicitly said in here, then it can't be something that Jesus wants us to know, that doesn't follow from our understanding of Revelation. It is, there's an organic quality to this. But um, I, I do think that there's a, there's a general sense that, well, the, you know, the, the Catholic Church has all these weird teachings and habits and customs and doctrines and disciplines, and, and it seems like they're not in, well, some of them aren't in the Bible, and where do you get all that stuff, and, and how, do we, how do we know? I, I would say, first of all, and this is what the whole class is going to be about, there are doctrines, there are disciplines, there are things, there are some things that we don't even, we, we say this is just part of our custom. We're not saying this is divinely inspired. You know, not having meat on Friday was not, it's not part of the divine revelation. It was, a, it was a discipline of the church. It's still discipline of the church. It's optional now rather than, than mandatory. But we're never saying Jesus told us we have to not eat meat on Friday. No, we never said, that, that was not, we're not, again, that's not divine public revelation. There are elements of the teaching, though, that we think are definitely based in Scripture very clearly. So if you ever go to the, the Catholic catechism and you think, well, this stuff's all made up, look at the footnotes at the bottom of the page. It's, it's saturated in Scripture. It's built on Scripture very much. You can spend twice as much time reading the Scriptures for each of the paragraphs of the catechism as the catechism itself. And so the public teaching it's true that most Catholics don't, couldn't quote you, okay, this whole idea of I understand that baptism, where does that come in Scripture? They, uh, 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 well, I don't know. Um, but if they took that, okay, let's, let's look at the Catechism, and then let's quote, let's look at what the, uh, the footnotes here on the Scriptures are and read about them, they could get to it. But, I think the Catholic understanding of the Bible as inspiration for one's person in prayer is weak. I think it's weak. We have other forms of prayer. Uh, and, and again, we're going to talk about prayer later. But I think that there's this wonderful reality here that we're missing. Now, for some Protestants, and when I talk about Protestant Christians, Protestant, Protestantism is a wide spectrum of beliefs and habits and, and, and teachings. And it's hard to sum up uh, everybody. So when I talk about Protestantism, sometimes, you know, I, I'm generalizing. And I never, I never mean to be negative. Uh, in, in these generalizations. I'm just trying to be able to be succinct. Oftentimes, that especially people, uh, Protestants who would be, uh, belong to a, a non-denominational church or an uh, a evangelical church of some kind, uh, probably not so much members of like Presbyterian or Lutheran uh, churches, but, you know, other, the, the, the Protestants of the, maybe a mega church or somebody like that, um, very faithful, Bible-believing Christian, okay? There's a tendency in there to put these two together. That the, my, my, my individual reading of the Scripture is the way in which I understand the public teaching of Christ in, in the Bible's revelation. And so there's this putting together, this is, this is such a central... T uh, experience for such a Protestant that, again, they're reading the text all the time. That's their, probably their main devotional practice. And from that, they're, they're getting their answer of what does God say about abortion, uh, heaven or hell, homosexuality, or marriage, or whatever it is. And there's very much a sense of, well, the main understanding of Revelation for me is the Holy Spirit will teach to talk to me directly. And that will, that will tell me what God wants, that, what God wants to say and reveal in himself in Jesus Christ. The Catholic understanding is much, it, 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 there's subtle differences, they're not so subtle, in that a Catholic perspective would say, God speaks publicly through, first and foremost, the whole people, the church. That this is, it's not that he doesn't speak to me privately, because he does, but if I want to know what he wants to teach humanity, he has made a means by which he will teach all of humanity the same coherent message. It's not, I believe this, and you believe that, and you believe that, and they'll, because so, so who really has the Holy Spirit here? You, we have opposite ideas of what the Holy Spirit wants is about marriage. Um, how is this working? It's the same Holy Spirit. The Catholic Church said, for those questions, it's a matter of faith to say, remember that magisterium, that whole idea of the apostles and their successors being inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, I have a message for you. I don't want you to mess up this life that I'm giving you. I'm, gonna, it, I'm a coherent. 
The Holy Spirit's teaching this whole thing. There's only one Holy Spirit, and there's only one gospel. And here it is. And I know that you are going to struggle with your understanding of this, and so I'm going to give you a way to know what happens to us, what I want, what your happiness will be, what your joy will be, and it's through this church, which is the body of Christ. Now, the loss in this, or the challenge for us, is that we think, okay, that's, that's something that the Bible does, great. Okay, but what about, does God talk to me directly? So I just want to finish up with this whole idea of Scripture is, is, a, is the means of prayer. It really is the Word of God. There's a power here. And so what we need to do is God will give me answers to my personal problems in reading Scripture. It's not going to contradict what the church teaches is right. It's not somewhere you're going to say, I guess I can't commit murder. You know, and didn't think so. There's a whole fifth commandment thing. But here there's the guy's killing somebody and seems to be a good guy. And so there it goes. Boom. It'll never happen. That's, that's obviously a misinterpretation of Scripture. That's your own self. But God will speak to you and to me to, to pray prayerfully reading Scripture. Um, there's going to be this private inspiration that's very real. The Holy Spirit does speak through the Scriptures. And every time you read the Scripture in prayer, you should, you should offer a prayer, Holy Spirit, show me what you want me to know. Enlighten me. Fill me. There should be a, a prayer to the Holy Spirit before you take and, and open the Scriptures. And you should do it. This is the way in which you're going to... You know, again, if you, if you want to walk the gospel life with Christ, you've got to read the Scriptures. It's not because it, I'll come up with a different opinion about some issue with the church. That's not the way you're going to, that's not the purpose of the reading of Scripture. The reading, purpose of reading of Scripture is, it's the Word of God that packs power, and God speaks through it. It really does. So, my suggestion for you is, if you really want to become a Catholic who's filled with holiness, filled with the life of God, it's really hard to believe that um, it's, it's, it's going to be as easy, fulfilling, and possible if you're not going to use one of the major reasons and ways that he, the God wants us to become one with him, which is through connection with the Word. You know, the thing is, here's just a very practical thing I, I like all of the Catholics here to do, at least. Is I, I preached about this this morning. You know, sometimes you say, Father, you always talk to us about 20 minutes of prayer a day. How are you going to live Christ if you don't spend time with Christ, right? So 20 minutes seems like a long time. What if you were to take the scriptures of the day, of the Eucharist, every single day there are scriptures that are being proclaimed in the Catholic Church from Australia to Chile to China. It's the same thing being read everywhere. And if we believe that this church is in fact the body of Christ, inspired and led by the Holy Spirit, then imagine the Holy Spirit is sending out a message to the entire Catholic world, around the world, the, the Holy Spirit has chosen these two scripture passages, or three, for you to meditate on. This is going to be something, there's a message directly for you in that. Because the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. I mean, if you want to spend your 20 minutes taking those two readings, and you can find them if you have the little magazine, Magnificat, or if you take a bulletin, the scriptures of the, the week are in the bulletin. All you have to do is take your bulletin and say, okay, today it's Luke 1, you know, whatever. Um, read those in your 20 minutes of prayer. And say, Holy Spirit, come and, and just slowly read them. See if something jumps out at you. Something grabs hold of you. Something slaps you in the face. Something says, makes you feel at peace. It doesn't mean it's easy, but something happens that, say, hmm, interesting, interesting text there. Um, what do you mean, what, God, what do you want me to take from that? It can be a perfect way in which you start your prayer. Okay? It's now 10 to 8. I told you I don't have very much time for questions here. Um, and I apologize for that. But I'm willing to take two questions. Because I think, I don't know, just two questions. Okay. Father, I'm uh, one of those senior lifelong Catholics that you referred to earlier. And my sense was that for much of my uh, adulthood, the church did not put very much emphasis on Scripture. But that seems to have changed in the last you know, 20 or 30 years. My the question was, you know, from, a, from an experienced uh, senior Catholic, um, that in the past, not so much stress was put on the scriptures. That's, 
this truth in the, in, the, in the past, certainly. I would say since Vatican II, there was, certainly was a renewal, although it, it started before. But in the last 50 years, there's been an attempt to certainly say, wait a minute, we're throwing out this, this, you know, this central uh, reality here of, of holiness. Um, so, yes, I, I don't take any of this that I've said to try to, to put down or denigrate the idea of every individual human being reading scripture and being able to interpret for himself, for himself. And we say, you know, I can say, boy, this is speaking to me this way, this right now. You're guided by the church, but, but also it's, it's speaking to me right now. Anything else? Another question? Okay. Let me finish with, uh, with a prayer, and we can call it a night. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of the scriptures. Uh, may we always love them. Uh, you sent your Son, Jesus, to be the Word made flesh. Let us simply immerse ourselves in this word that has come to us in this way in which we can understand with your help and guidance. So bless all of us here to be uh, deep lovers of, the, of your word and scriptures, that we might know the way you speak to us, that we might know you and live, and live in you and with you. And I ask all these things through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.